Hi, this is the voice, Michael Shavello. You're listening to the Premium Odds Cast, hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas, fight scientist and author of Fightnomics, Reed Kuhn, and MMA journalist Brian Heminger. The absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting, MMAOddsBreaker.com. Welcome to the Premium Oddscast, presented by Five Dime Sportsbook. I'm Brian Hemminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts oddsmaker Nick Aligas to break down this Saturday's UFC 216 event, which takes place in Las Vegas, Nevada. If you're unfamiliar with our format, Nick and I will break down the fight card from top to bottom, providing extensive analysis and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Looking back at our last event, we had no place for UFC Fight Night 117, but we did win our one-unit free bet on Daichi Abe at plus 110 odds. Back to the present, UFC 216 features a 13-fight card in total and will be aired on UFC Fight Pass, FX, and Pay-Per-View this Saturday night. Let's dive right in. Now, kicking things off on Fight Pass is a flyweight contest between Matt Schnell, who is 10-4, and, and Marco Beltran, who is 8-6. and six. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Schnell minus 190, the comeback on Beltron at plus 150, and that's at our sponsored sportsbook, 5dimes.eu, so make sure you guys always check them out. Right now over at 5 Dimes, it is currently Schnell, still the favorite, but slight favorite, minus 125. The comeback on Beltron is at plus 105, so early action did come in on the underdog Beltron. A lot of people think that Schnell, I guess, his chin is just had it at this point. I mean, he is coming off back-to-back uh, knockout losses. I mean, Sandoval got him in his last fight. Uh, Rob Plant got him in the fight before that, and those are both heavy hitters. That I mean, it's not a shock that those guys would knock anybody uh, that they face out because they have that much knockout power. But unfortunately for Schnell, he's the one that fell on the uh, the bad side of those losses. I mean, not a good sign for him, not a good look for him either because, I mean, his chin's not going to get any better. He is 27 years old. He is a really good fighter, so he still has some upside to him. If he could get that D in check and and his chin can last a little bit, the guy has a ton of talent. I mean, he's a pretty well-rounded fighter, of course. I mean, he's been on the Ultimate Fighter uh, TV show. He's been on MTV, those shows. So he's kind of in the mainstream as far as the MMA fans out there. A lot of fans do know who he is, and they do – I think at least acknowledge that he is a skilled fighter. I mean, the guy, I think where it's at for him is his ground game above anything else. The guy gets you to the floor. He's able to utilize the submission skill. And, and that I think is the biggest edge he's going to have against Beltron. Beltron's another one of these guys that has improved since his time on the ultimate fighter, another tough alum. Um, he's gotten better. He's been putting in the work. You could see some improvements from him by far in his stand up game, his conditioning. I mean, his ground game across the board, but the problem with him is, he is also suffering back-to-back losses. I mean, he got submitted by Joe Soto, which is not a bad loss in my opinion. And then, of course, in his last fight, he was getting torched um, to Alcantara as well. So he needs a win. He's badly need. He needs to uh, rebound here and, and get the win over Schnell. So both these guys, I think, are kind of on the brink of being cut from the roster. So it's a must-win fight. Now, how they match up together, I think really it's pretty simple. Beltron is going to want to keep this thing on, on his feet and uh, try to knock Schnell out. Schnell is going to want to uh, utilize his submission game and try to get uh, Beltron's back or get him on the ground and submit him here as well. So I think that's the way it pl- plays out. I think both these guys will be competitive back and forth. But I do lean a little bit more towards Schnell um, than Beltron in this spot. I think the Schnell can probably weather the storm that Beltron brings early on. I don't think Beltron is as explosive or dynamic as the two losses Schnell recently suffered on the feet. So I think he can kind of weather that storm and then find his opportunity to get Beltron down and probably win this fight by submission. If not, I think he could probably win the cards as well. So I will go against the grain. I mean, everybody seems to be on Beltron's hype train for this fight. I'll still have a little bit of faith in Schnell, and I'll pick him to win this fight. And I like Schnell too. I mean, Beltran is a guy that is a decent overall fighter, had a good start to his UFC career, but he seems like he's progressing a little bit as he has stepped up in competition. And then the drop to flyweight did not go well, getting uh, stopped in the second round. Now, Schnell, I mean, he had an interesting route. Uh, He took a fight on short notice at Bantamweight and got smoked by Rob Font, which can happen. Rob Font's very good. Schnell was fighting out of his weight class. The problem, though, was... Uh, in Schnell's next fight, he also got smoked, uh, got finished quickly in the first round. So he really needs to prove that 
he can showcase his actual skills in a fight in the UFC. I mean, he's, he's been hurt and finished early in both of his UFC bouts. So now he's fighting much further down the totem pole in terms of competition level. And I think this is a winnable fight for him. Granted, Marco Beltran, even though he's not the most powerful guy and he doesn't have any knockouts in the UFC, he can still scrap and brawl. And if he connects with something solid, Schnell will probably go out. I mean, he just doesn't have that great of a chin. That being said, I think Schnell actually is a talented striker. He just can't absorb punishment. He can dish it out. He could knock Beltran out on the feet. He could mix it up and get the fight to the floor where he actually is a very talented ground fighter um, with wrestling and submissions and ground and pound. So Schnell is the better overall technical fighter. I think he's actually the better striker of the two as well. It's just he has that knockout button. And if Beltran hits it, he's going to win. So I'm concerned about Schnell's durability, but I'm still going to pick him here because I just think overall he's the better fighter with more potential. He just has to protect that chin. Now moving up to the middleweight division, we have Talis Latis, who is 27 and 7, taking on Brad Tavares, who is 15 and 5. Now Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I have been Tavares minus 155 to come back on latest at plus 115. Right now, looking over to five dimes, it is Tavares minus 200 to come back on latest is at plus 170. So line did get bet up a little bit. There is more action coming in Tavares' way. This was kind of tough. Tough to determine which way the early action would come in. Um, I leaned a little bit more towards Tavares here in this spot. It looks like it was the right call, obviously, because the line did get bet up. But this is still an interesting matchup. I mean, I guess it's more of what have you done for me lately. And Tavares, after uh, you know a little layoff, came back and got a, a good win over Teodoro, which Teodoro does get a, a decent amount of respect out there from the fans, from the betting community as well, typically speaking. So that, that's a pretty solid win to come back to. And really, Tavares has always had talent. He's always had skill. He's a decent-sized middleweight. He's got a, a well-rounded skill set overall. And I think that he is the better striker in this matchup against Lightus. So if he could keep the fight upright and utilize his decent takedown defense against a guy like Lightus, I think he can have success here. Now, he's got to be careful because one issue with Tavares always in the back of my head is going to be that chin. I mean, it's strange because at times I think that – I mean, the guy made it through a fight with Yoel Romero. Romero hits very hard, as we all know. I mean, he's a devastating knockout type of artist, and Tavares was able to, even though he got brutalized at times in that fight, he was able to make it all three rounds with him. And then he goes out there against Bosch and gets knocked out. So it, it's strange. You can't gauge on, uh, you know, the right way with, I guess, Tavares' chin. You never know. I mean, it's, it's, it is suspect in my opinion, and it's always a concern. So even though Lightus isn't exactly a knockout type of artist, he has been getting a little bit more confident on the feet lately. You could tell that he's putting more into his punches, and he is a threat on the feet uh, these days, let's face it, with his uh, striking ability, especially if Tavares' chin is a little bit suspect. But how the fight's supposed to play out, Lightus should go after those takedowns. Uh, he, he tries to slow the pace of the fight down a little bit, pinning people up against Cage, going as I said, for those takedowns, getting your back and that sort of thing and looking for the submission. So Lightus is going to try to do that. He'll probably push forward and uh, try to accomplish that goal. And, and Tavares is going to try to stifle him a little bit, sprawl, brawl, and then try to line him up on the feet. So I do lean a little bit more towards Tavares here. If his takedown defense holds, again, I think he is the better striker. I think he can outpoint Lightus and probably edge out a close decision type of win. But where the current betting line is right now, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it got bet up too high. I think if you look at Lightus, I know he's – you know, coming off of a loss or two along the way. Um, well, actually, he's coming off a win over Sam Alvey. But before that, I mean, he was a little bit mixed. He, he lost at Gegard Musasi. He has a win in between against Kamozi. And then um, the Jocko fight, he lost as well. So I think people are, are kind of down on him a little bit. But that being said, he did rebound again, again in his last fight against a very tough knockout artist in his own right in Sam Alvey and, and got that W here. So I think people are disrespecting uh Light is just a little bit. I think the line shouldn't be where it's at right now. So it's, it is a dog or pass situation with the current betting odds, and I expect it to drop back down to reality a little bit and probably closer towards that opener. But as far as a pure pick goes, I give the slightest edge to Tavares, so that's where I'm going to go. And I can understand Tavares picking up the win. I mean, he's a little bit more limber. I think he's the smoother striker. And... Tavares seems like he's on a little bit more momentum, but if you go back and look at, you know, Letus' losses recently, they're not that bad. I mean, 
he lost to Gegard Mousasi, and he didn't even get finished by him. It was just a decision. Yeah, it was a one-sided decision, but he still didn't get finished by one of the best middleweights in the world. He had a five-round, ridiculously close split decision against current champion Michael Bisping. And he did have a tough fight against Christoph Jotko. Now, the Jotko fight is the one that stands out to me. I mean, Lidas is getting a little older now, 36 years old, and... If Tavares can follow that similar game plan of just putting a little pressure on Latus, avoiding getting taken down, and just outstriking him, then he has a decent shot to win. My issue is Tavares does have a bad chin as well. Like There are multiple fighters on this card that are extremely talented, but they just have really bad chins. And Tavares is one of those. I mean, this guy has just been dropped from shots that didn't even look like they got thrown hard. So that's something you definitely have to consider here. And Talos Letus is the more well-rounded fighter of the two. I mean, Tavares has pulled off some impressive performances inside the octagon, but uh, Letus has knocked guys out on the feet, he's gone toe-to-toe with the champ, and Letus is very good on the ground. So for Tavares to win, I think he needs to use... Uh, his wrestling in reverse, keep it standing, and then just try to outwork and outstrike Latus over the course of three rounds. And I don't, I don't see Tavares knocking Latus out. That's really not his style. So, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a tall task. Latus isn't the greatest striker, but he's had some pretty good moments on the feet, some impressive performances, particularly the one against Bisbing. Uh, I don't think Tavares is so technical that he'll make Latus look silly. So I think Latus can hold his own in the stand-up. And then if it goes to the ground, I think it's Latus that can initiate it. Tavares has pretty good takedown defense, but Latus might be able to pull to get him to the floor. So I'm actually going to slightly lean Talos Latus, the underdog here. Um, granted, Tavares could win, absolutely. And, and the game plan is there from some past performances where Latus lost, but... I think if Latus can mix it up, make this an MMA fight, he might be able to pull this off. So I'm going to side with Talos Latus. Now dropping back down to the flyweight division, we have John Moraga, who is 17 and 6, taking on Magomed Bibulatov, who is 14 and 0. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Bibulatov minus 405 to come back on Moraga at plus 285 right now over at five times. It is Bibulatov coming in at minus 525 to come back on Moraga is at plus 415. So needless to say, a little bit more action coming in on Bibulatov and he's been bet up. A lot of people have faith and confidence that this guy is the next big thing to watch in the flyweight division. I mean, the guy has a well-rounded skill set. He's had a lot of hype coming in to the UFC debut that he had an impressive debut, I should say, over a very game opponent in Lasau. So I think Bibulutov is one of those guys that can make a run towards the the flyweight title here. And another step towards that is here against Moraga. Again, Moraga, very game. I mean, he's faced the best of the best in the flyweight division thus far. There's no question about that. He's had a lot of success, and, and he's a solid out. I mean, the guy has a lot of power on the feet. He can knock you out. He's got a decent wrestling game to go along with it, and he's got a sick guillotine choke. So Moraga is a pretty complete fighter, but I don't think across the board he matches up with Babulatov here. I think Babulatov is one of those guys that it just hasn't beat almost in every area. In the stand-up game, even though Moraga has some power, I think uh, Babulatov matches him in that aspect of things. I think he's just a little bit more diverse. He's got the speed. He's got the angles. He's got that unorthodox but clean technique. He likes to throw a lot of spins. So I think if this stays standing, Babulatov actually has the advantage over Moraga. I think he, he pushes the pace a little bit higher as well. And then, of course, the wrestling game is, is where it's at for uh, Babulatov as well. He's able to get the fight to the floor more times than not, able to control his opponents, has some nasty ground to pound. He's capable of, of winning by submission as well. Here, I think against Moraga, it's going to be tough to do so, but that being said, I think he can still dictate and control the tempo and the pace of this fight. So, I opened him a solid favorite. The betters out there early on came in, and it, w- it wasn't quite high enough, and they believed in him as well, and I do. I think it's hard to pick against him right now, especially in this matchup. I mean, Moraga is kind of in that spot where he's going to be nothing more than a gatekeeper, unfortunately, for him right now. Um, so this is just kind of another step towards, uh, like I said, a, a possible title run for Bibulatov. So we'll see where it goes from here, but there's no question you got to like the Russian coming into this fight. So I'm picking him to win. Plain and simple, 
I think John Moraga's time is kind of past. Uh, he was a, a hotshot prospect when he first entered the, the UFC, but now he hasn't looked so great. I mean, he had that tough three-fight losing streak, and most recently he did pick up a win, but that's just not enough. I mean, he was he was facing somebody that was like a, a late replacement. It was and it, a UFC newcomer. It wasn't exactly an impressive victory, and now he's facing, in my opinion, the best flyweight prospect on the planet in Babulatov. There's just no way I can side with Moraga here. Babulatov, I think, has him beat everywhere. He's the better wrestler. He's the more technical striker. He can push a higher pace. I think he's as good, if not better, with submissions. I think he has just as much knockout power. And uh, to top it all off, he, I think, is uh, younger. Let me double check. Uh, yeah. So John Moraga just can't hold a, a candle next to Babulatov. I just, I really like Babulatov. This guy is on the rise. He's a terrific prospect. And if he gets another couple wins, people are going to be talking about him as the guy that might be able to dethrone champion Demetrius Johnson. So uh, I, I'm definitely on the Babulatov train. I think the hype is justified and I think he's going to win however he sees fit. But uh, I think it's tough to finish John Moraga. So I'm going to play it safe and say Babulatov picks up a decision. Now, this brings us to the main event of the Fight Pass prelims. It is a heavyweight attraction between Walt Harris, who is 10 and 5, and Mark Godbeer, who is 12 and 3. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I up in Harris, minus 300, the comeback on Godbeer at plus 220. Right now, looking over five dimes, it is currently. Harris, minus 310, the comeback on Godbeer is at plus 255. So needless to say, again, a little bit more action coming in. Harris's way, nothing significant, though. I mean, it's only a 10-cent move right now, but there's a lot of parlays that will get bet on Harris, I'm sure. Godbeer just doesn't get that respect factor from a lot of the betters out there. I mean, he honestly, let's say it like it is. I mean, he's definitely on the kind of lower tier of the heavyweight roster in the UFC. And from top to bottom, that heavyweight roster in the UFC is not that loaded. So... I mean, he's he's an okay fighter, probably a little bit underrated, but at the same time here against Harris, uh, it's going to be a tough fight for him because Harris is the more athletic, the more explosive fighter. Um, he's definitely been on the terrors of late, and he's getting a little bit more confidence um, with his winning ability as, as well. So he has a nice win over Sherman. Recently, he got a nice win over uh, Asker as well, but he ended up uh, winning both of those fights. Um, he finished him in the second and, uh, and then the last fight in the first round as well. So he's getting some early finishes and, I mean, he has that kind of explosive power. I mean, he can, he can beat you with his hands. He can beat you with his legs. I mean, the guy is definitely, uh, a guy to, to watch out for on the feet. And Godbeer, I think, it doesn't have the wrestling to put Harris on his back. And Harris overall has decent takedown defense as well. Now, Godbeer likes to stand and bang as well. So it's not like he, he doesn't like to stand and fight on the feet. He does. But I just think, again, the athleticism of Harris, I think Harris can mix things up a little bit more. I think Godbeer is going to get tagged a little bit more as well. So I think that's why you got to make sol Harris a solid favorite here. And I kind of agree with where the line is now. Now, that being said, as far as the bet goes, it's kind of tough because I would not lay three to one on Harris, mainly because of his chin. He has been knocked out a couple couple times in his career and Godbeer does have a little bit of power so I don't think Godbeer wins a striking battle here but at the same time how could you really trust anyone's chin that's been knocked out a few times um you know laying that kind of price so I think it's one of those situations where you pick Harris but at this point unless the line drops significantly you kind of stay away from it as a bet so the pick is Harris he probably does end up uh, finishing another fight along the way um and he wins by knockout over Godbeer that's my pick Walt Harris has looked pretty good in recent fights. I think he's finally started to come into his own after a rough initial UFC run. This second run has looked a lot better. He's he's looked more dangerous, more powerful. He's more composed inside the octagon. And honestly, you know, Mark Godbeer has never exactly been a world beater. I mean, yeah, he was able to pick up a victory over uh, Daniel Spitz when Spitz was fighting on short, super short notice. But, uh, I mean, Justin Ledet smoked him, uh, Czech Congo smoked him in Bellator and Congo was like 40 years old at the time almost. And I just don't think God beers that good. I mean, he's got some power and Harris has been hurt on the feet and finished before. So God beer could knock him out, but 
I think the much more likely outcome is Harris connects with something nasty and puts God beer on his keister. So plain and simple. I just, I like Walt Harris here. I think that he doesn't just win. He probably wins by stoppage in the first round. Now, moving on to the FX portion of the prelims and dropping down to the women's strawweight division. We have Pearl Gonzalez, who is six and two, taking on Pauliana Botello, who is five and one. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? Open Botello minus one fifty, the comeback on Gonzalez at plus one ten. Right now, looking for five times, Botello's minus one thirty five, the comeback on Gonzalez is plus one fifteen. So line margins have tightened up a little bit, and there is two way action coming in on this fight. Another tricky fight because you got two talented ladies going out of here. Um, that definitely deserve to be on this roster. So I like what I see Gonzalez. I mean, unfortunately for her, I know that she, uh, obviously she was disappointed um, in her UFC debut against uh, Calveo, but she showed a lot of skill in that fight as well. And even before her debut loss to Calveo, she actually has faced some decent competition along the way. Um, she's defeated a lot of girls as well. I mean, she's six and two overall. And again, over decent competition along the way. So Gonzalez is a pretty well-rounded fighter. She's a warrior. You could tell just by, you know, the way she presented herself on short notice against a, a girl like Aveo. I think Gonzalez is, is very technical, especially on the ground. That's where I think her best attribute is, is getting the fight to the floor. And once on the floor, her submission game is really slick. And so that's where it's at with her. But even on the feet, I mean, I know, again, she was getting tagged at times by Calveo, but uh, she couldn't, she packs a punch. I mean, for the female division, a lot of times we're not used to seeing uh, heavy hitters or whatnot. I'm not saying Gonzalez is one, but at the, you can't underestimate her power on the feet either. So I think what you're going to see here is Gonzalez probably trying to get this fight to the ground because that's where, again, she's going to have the bigger advantage over Botello in this spot and then try to obviously win this fight by submission. If not, if she's not able to get the fight to the floor, I think it's going to be a tough night for her because Botella, she's coming in. Um, making her UFC debut. Now she's been out since 2000, uh, since 2015 and she's had some injuries along the way. Uh, and she is dropping down to 115 pounds. She's been fighting a flyweight. So she's making the move down to 115 pounds. So there's a lot of intriguing factors here with her. But outside of that, if you look at her on footage and on film, man, she's nothing but impressive. I mean, the f- competition level usually in, in Brazil and some of the smaller organizations isn't that great, but for her, she's actually faced some decent competition. So she's entering the the UFC. I think she, and she's already proven somewhat as far as competition level goes. Now, overall skill set, she's a BJJ blue belt. She's a Muay Thai black belt. So she's basically a striker that has been working on, you know, the other tools of her game with the grappling aspect, with a little bit of wrestling as well. And she's become a complete fighter, but man, on the feet, she is fun to watch. I mean, she brings it. Uh, she she's aggressive. Talk about knockout power. She does have it. So in the females, again, they kind of lack that knockout power at times uh, from what we're used to seeing compared to some of the guy fights. But I'll tell you what, I mean, Botello brings it to the point where she's finished five fights by knockout. All five of her wins have been uh, in that way. So she's no joke on the feet at all. I mean, and her aggression is, is fun to watch because it's clean aggression. It's weird because she's, I mean, at times she gets a, you know, maybe a, a little bit too aggressive and she might lose her balance or throw a kick and end up on her back. So you got to be cautious with that sort of thing. But overall, it's not like she's throwing just big haymaker bombs or, or anything like that. I mean, it's pretty, it's good technique that goes along with it. So I think this is going to be a fun fight. I mean, both these ladies again are skilled. I think it's going to come down to if Botello can stay off her back. If she does stay off her back, even though she has a little bit of submission game to go along with it, I think Gonzalez trumps her in that area. But I think if she does stay off her back, She's going to probably get the W here and maybe even by finish because, I mean, like I said, she's finished the the previous five opponents she's defeated. So Botello's fun to watch. I'm going to pick her to win this fight. I think the sky's the limit for her. If she keeps on um, improving her overall game and she keeps on fighting at a more steady pace, obviously you want to, you don't want to see the injuries or the time off. But I think she can make a run towards that 115-pound title shot at one point. So excited to see her fight. I think it's going to be a fun fight, and I'm picking her to win the fight. So Botello is the side for me. For this being a matchup between a fighter who's had one UFC fight and a fighter that has never fought in the UFC, it's a surprisingly solid scrap. Uh, Pearl Gonzalez is uh, a talented fighter that was on a really nice win streak before she got the, the invite to the UFC, and then she faced Cynthia Calvillo in her first fight, one of the best prospects in the division. And um, Botello, I really like her. Uh, as Nick mentioned, I mean, she is just ferocious on the feet. She has... A lot of power. She's finished all five of her opponents by TKO in all of her victories. 
So uh, if Pearl Gonzalez keeps this fight standing, and she's, she kept a pretty good portion of her last fight standing against Calvillo, then I think she's going to be in big, big trouble. Um, the other problem is that Pearl Gonzalez, as good of a ground game as she has, and it is pretty good, she doesn't have the best takedowns. For the most part, she likes to... Uh, if the fight goes to the floor, I mean, she just has a really active guard. She can pick up triangle chokes and arm bars and maybe get some sweeps going. But I don't see her having a lot of success in actually forcing the fight to the floor. That's where I think Botello is going to shine, is just working her over on the feet. Gonzalez is tough. I mean, she took some damage in the Cal- Calvillo fight in her UFC debut. But Botello, I think, being a bigger fighter and dropping down... I think she's going to really put some pop in her punches, and that could do some serious damage. Uh, Botello's only loss is to Pereira, another fighter that's in the UFC and is actually, I think, 13-0 and overall, and she's ranked in the top 15 now. So uh, that's not exactly somebody that is that bad that she lost to. So, uh, th- I, again, I think this is a good matchup, and I hope that uh, e- if Pearl Gonzalez loses it, that they don't cut her for going 0-2 because she's faced two very, very talented fighters. So I'm going to side with Botello. I think that she has a very bright future in this division, and I think she can really do some damage and make some uh, nice highlight reels for the girls, especially with striking, which is something they need. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, this is Botello's fight to lose as long as she doesn't get stuck on her back. So my pick is, go- is going to be Botello. Now moving up to the lightweight division, we have Lando Veneta, who is nine and two, taking on Bobby Green, who is twenty three and eight. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Veneta minus two sixty, the comeback on Green at plus one eighty. Right now, looking over five dimes, it's Veneta minus two twenty, the comeback on Green plus one eighty. So line margins have tightened up again. Two reaction is coming into this fight as well. Veneta, obviously, the more popular fighter of the two, as far as not that Green is not a popular fighter, but the hype train has been more so on Veneta. I mean, it got derailed a little bit um, in his last fight because he lost to Tamer, and what was a great fight. I mean. Uh, in my opinion, Veneta stock did not drop in my eyes, at least, because that was a war. And, and Tamer is one of those fighters that gets severely underrated and underestimated until this fight, probably until his win over Veneta. I think that probably got him to the point where he's going to get a little bit more respect. So the point being is that was a very respectable loss. So even though he's he's coming off a loss and the hype train got derailed a little bit, Veneta is still a great fighter and he could still make a run towards that 155 pound title. I mean, that's how skilled this guy is as well. I mean, the guy is a wrestler at heart, but he's got a complete game. I mean, his striking, if you watch his movement on the feet, he's got power. He's a little bit unorthodox as well with some pretty clean technique, of course. And he trains with uh, Greg Jackson and crew in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So, you know, he's coming from a good camp. So a lot to like about Veneta. Now, on the other hand, Green has been one of these guys that has been really overachieving. He's, you know, one of these guys that also has faced really good competition. And through the years, you've got to watch his improvement. I mean, he's been around this sport for a long time. I mean, you know, a lot of uh, different organizations. And finally, when he made his, his UFC debut, he's impressed. I mean, he's he's been on quite a roll overall. And then he's kind of had some setbacks, some injuries, and he's now on a three-fight losing skid overall, I believe. So from starting off relatively hot and, and being one of these guys that you thought would potentially maybe possibly make a run towards a UFC title shot at one point, Green, I mean, uh, unfortunately for him, has been derailed a little bit, but he's faced some decent competition, like his last fight, Magomedov. That was a tough fight, and he actually performed a lot better than most people give him credit for. I mean, he was a solid underdog in that fight, and I mean, he, he ended up making it uh, such a close fight that the judges... Uh, gave it to Magomedov by split decision. So he, he performed respectively in that fight. And I think he needed to do so because the fight before that against Poirier, Green unfortunately got knocked out. So he didn't want to see him kind of hit that decline spot that fast, you know, because Green, I think, still has a, a little bit left in the tank. And I think matchup wise against a lot of lightweights out there, he can win and still be very successful in the UFC lightweight division. So this is another tough fight. For both men, and I mean, they're not giving Veneta a bone here at all with Green because I think Green again probably is going to come into this fight a little bit underrated and underestimated. And if Veneta doesn't get him out of there, I think if his fight hits the scorecards, I can still see Veneta winning a decision, maybe two rounds to one. But it probably gets closer as the fight progresses a little bit. I mean, I think out of the two, 
both these guys can make it three rounds, obviously, but I, I do think that Green has a better tank, and even though he at times is a little bit too tentative for my liking, as the fight progresses, I think he might gain a little bit more confidence, and he might pick up the pace a little bit, so Veneta has to be cautious with that, but overall, I think Veneta can win this fight by stoppage. I think Veneta can also win it on the scorecards, and I think he does get back on track here and gets an impressive win over a very tough fighter in Green, so my pick is Veneta to get the W. This is a, an intriguing matchup. I mean, Bobby Green, at the peak of his game, was a top 10 UFC lightweight. Now, obviously, he fell off a little bit, but it's not like he was losing to nobodies either. I mean, Edson Barboza is uh, Dustin Poirier, and then, obviously, uh, Magomedov in that last fight, or in the last loss. So, it's not like he's just getting destroyed by guy's way better than him. I mean, he is facing elite fighters, and he's having competitive fights against some of them. And uh, Lando Veneta is a guy that is trying to get that next level, but he keeps kind of falling short a little bit. I mean, he had that amazing UFC debut on short notice where he almost knocked off Tony, Tony Ferguson, who's one of the best lightweights in the world right now. And then he smashes John McDessie and then uh, loses convincingly in his last fight when he was a huge hyped favorite. So... He's been defying expectations almost at every moment, which has been kind of crazy. So this is a good test to see where Veneta is because Bobby Green's a guy with experience against some of the best fighters in the world, but he doesn't have a lot of wins against the best fighters in the world. I mean, Green's best victory was probably, um, you know, when he stopped, I'm trying to think, or when he got the, the win over Josh Thompson when, when Thompson was running pretty high, but... I mean, for the most part, uh, Green has been competitive against really good fighters, but he hasn't quite been able to get, you know, quite over that peak. And um, against Veneta, I think Veneta should be the more active fighter, the flashier fighter. Green does a really good job of no-selling his opponent's attacks, trying to, to make it seem like they they weren't effective. And... Um, he also can dish it out. I mean, uh, if he's facing like a counter striker, Green will be the initiator and force the action, and he does a good job. So, with a Veneta, I mean, he's exciting, and if he can fight to his potential, I think that he should win this fight. Uh, Bobby Green has started to slow down a little bit. He's getting a little bit older. He's not over the hill or anything, but uh, he did get knocked out. Uh, in, a, in one of his more recent fights. So I think there's a potential here for Veneta to pick up a stoppage if he can connect with something solid. And you got to remember, Bobby Green didn't fight for about two years. So, uh, and he's still just trying to get his bearings a little bit. He, he looked pretty good in the Magomedov fight, but again, he still lost. So if a Veneta can just keep a solid pace and... Keep Green guessing by mixing things up, which Veneta is great at because he has such an unorthodox attacks and with spinning attacks, kicks, punches, you know it, you name it. Uh, I think that there's a good chance that he can keep Green off balance enough to have him on the defensive more often than he'd like. So I think with that, Veneta has a good ch chance of winning a decision and Veneta has a decent chance of winning by knockout. So I'm going to side with Veneta. Now, sticking with the lightweight division, we have Will Brooks, who is 18 and 3, taking on Nick Lentz, who is 29, 8 and 2, with one no contest. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I opened Brooks minus 300 to come back on Lentz at plus 220. Right now, looking over five dimes, it's actually Brooks minus 365 to come back on Lentz at plus 305. So, more action coming in Brooks' way. Early on, at least, and I mean, we'll get to action on this fight for sure because Lentz will generate some betting respect. I mean, he's faced some high-level competition throughout his whole career, and he's performed relatively well against most. Now, I understand that Lentz is coming off of a, a pretty disappointing loss. I mean, he's he's been bouncing back and forth. Obviously, he, he dropped to 145, then he's been bouncing. He came back up to 155. That's what I'm talking about, the bounce as far as weight classes go. And he got back on track Um in the lightweight division somewhat with Castillo and then the, the catch weight with him ride that he had. But his last fight against Makashev, he kind of got dominated. And a lot of that was, I um, mean, he spent too much time on his back. So here that's what Brooks kind of looks to do more so than anything else as well. I mean, Makashev is an excellent wrestler. 
uh, Brooks has that kind of surprising wrestling um, credentials that, I mean, he doesn't have your typical Russian or college all American type of uh, resume, but I mean, obviously he's a former Bellator champion and he's been able to have some success on the ground, even with the likes of guys like Michael Chandler um, and, and a lot of other fights. So Brooks is a very talented, capable ground fighter. But on top of that, he also has some decent striking and I think his striking keeps on improving fight by fight. Now in the UFC thus far though, unfortunately for Brooks, I mean, a lot of people thought he could come in and, and make an immediate impact and, and kind of make a run towards that title shot as well. And he suffered, I mean, the, the lost Oliveira. I mean, Oliveira was just huge as far as physical size goes against Brooks. And it really showed in that fight that, I mean, he, he just overwhelmed Brooks, I think. Um, and, and unfortunately for Brooks, he ended up getting finished late in that fight. Um, and then following that up, he faced another Oliveira, uh, Charles Oliveira. So I'm just talking about Alex at first. And now we're talking about Charles here. And he, he got, uh, submitted by a guy that could pretty much submit anybody, um, if he gets the opportunity. I mean, Oliveira, Charles Oliveira is one of the most dangerous submission fighters I think ever on the UFC roster. I mean, that's how sneaky good this guy is with the submission games. Now, some people have survived him, but most people do not. So that those are both decent losses, respectable losses. But unfortunately for Brooks, they both came after he made his UFC debut, which was a kind of a lackluster one against Ross Pearson. I mean, a lot of people thought he'd go out there and, and really impress over Pearson more so than he did. So you get a W in your first fight in the UFC and you don't look that great. And then you suffer back-to-back -back losses. It's not a good look. So Brooks, this is a must win fight for him. He needs to show that he's still relevant in the lightweight division. If he loses to a guy like Lentz, even though it's a respectable loss in some ways, because Lentz isn't exactly your can type of fighter. I mean, the guy is a solid and a tough fight for most people. Brooks needs to get this win. And I think he will. I think this fight probably stays upright for the most part. I think Brooks can get some takedowns when he wants. I mean, he doesn't have, again, that traditional wrestling background, but he manages pretty well to get the fight to the floor. So he ties up Lentz, gets him down to the ground. I think he spent some top position. He has to be careful because Lentz is a very complete fighter has a very dangerous guillotine choke and he goes after that choke quite a bit so brooks has to be cautious about that outside of that though i think it's brooks fight to control i think he is out of the two again he can control the ground aspect a little bit more if it stays on the feet i think brooks has a little bit more length and he'll utilize that and he'll be a little bit more effective on the feet as well so i just think he has the edge everywhere here the ufc is trying to feed him a solid win i think in my opinion here because lentz has just been one of those fighters that's been around for so long i mean there's not really a great upside to lentz as far as the ufc roster goes but a win over Lance for Brooks gets him back on track, gets him back some respect that he desperately needs and gets him back probably some confidence. So this fight was catered for a Brooks win. I think it probably goes down that way. So my pick is Brooks to get the W over Lance. The main thing here in this fight is where does Nick Lance have the best chance to win? On the feet, Will Brooks is a pretty good striker. I mean, he's not a world beater on the feet, but he can hold his own. I mean, he had those amazing fights with Michael Chandler and Bellator. And if he can just bring that same uh, tenacity and technical ability, he should destroy Lentz on the feet. And then in terms of wrestling, Brooks is the better athlete. He's a little bit physically bigger and stronger than Lentz, who has been able to make light featherweight in the past. Brooks couldn't make featherweight in a million years. Um, in terms of conditioning, Brooks has had multiple five-round fights. The only time he's ever faded in a fight was when he hurt his rib against Oliveira and faded in the third round, which would happen to a lot of people if they had a broken rib. So where does Nick Lentz win? Maybe it's just that can do itiveness that he kind of has. Lentz has done more with less in his career for quite a while now, just because he has a lot of heart, he's tough, he pushes a tempo, and he can grind guys out. But I just don't know if that will work against Will Brooks, who has a similar skill set, but he's just a little bit better than him in all those areas. I mean, he's bigger, he's stronger, he has a longer reach, he's the better striker, He's at least as good of a wrestler, probably better. So I just, I'm not sure where Nick Lentz can win this fight unless he knocks him out. And Lentz doesn't exactly have a lot of power, but I guess that's the best chance he has because what Brooks did get knocked out by Saad Awad back in Bellator and, uh, Oliveira TKO'd him with, after he'd heard, he hurt his rib. So, or maybe he catches him with the guillotine choke, but for the most part, I think it's more of a, catching him type of situation for Nick Lentz because technical technique for technique, he just 
isn't there. And I know Will Brooks has had a disappointing run in the UFC so far, but this might be the fight where he turns it around. Um, and I, I just think it's a good matchup for him. So I'm going to side with Will Brooks. I think he can win convincingly. Now dropping down to the Bantamweight division, we have Tom Duque Noir, who is 15 and 1 with one no contest, taking on Cody Stammen, who is also 15 and 1. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Duque Noir, minus 150, the comeback on Stammen at plus 110 right now, over five times. There's a little bit more love coming in on Duque Noir. It's currently minus 165. The comeback on Stamen is at plus 145. So again, a little bit more action come in Duquesne Wah's way. I mean, he is the height fighter. I mean, I believe the uh, last time we put a line on him, he closed around minus 1,000. So, and that was his UFC debut. Now, of course, it was against Patrick Williams, but hey, let's not mistake. Patrick Williams is a, a wrestler that can effectively get the fight to the floor and has some knockout power on the feet as well. So it's not like he was minus a thousand over a, a total can, but again, uh, Duquesne Wall actually got tested in that fight a little bit. It, it wasn't an easy fight for him, at least early on, but then it showed as, uh, especially as Williams started to fade a little bit, um, it showed who the better fighter was. Duquesne Wall is just one of those guys that's relentless on the feet. He's a well-rounded fighter, but he really has that killer instinct and he mixes stuff up. Like I said, really well on the feet has knockout power with good accuracy to go along with it. And again, a little bit unorthodox with his angles, with the way he goes about things, and very accurate with his striking with power. He's working on that takedown defense. It's getting better for sure. But again, Patrick Williams was able to get him down a little bit in that fight. And Stamen, that's that's where he has the advantage here. I think that he's going to be the one, if anything at all, he's going to be the one pursuing the wrestling and the takedowns. And Stamen's wrestling, I mean, so far so good. It looks great for him. He has an explosive double leg, and he's going to be coming in looking to do what Patrick Williams did early on and try to to finish off I mean, what Williams started in that fight, which was being able to exploit maybe that takedown defense a little bit um, in Duquesne Wall's game and, and get uh, control of the ground aspect. But the thing with Duquesne Wall is he ends up getting back to his feet relatively quick. He's smart enough to understand and know that he can't spend time off his back. So he's been working and drilling, and you could tell, I mean, the work has, has really come through because he was able to, again, get himself out of tough spots and get back to his feet. Now, on the feet, that's where he's going to take over and take control because I think even though Stamen is a decent striker, he's got a little bit of pop in his punches. He's got, obviously, that wrestler's power to go along with it. Um, he's got some speed, too, but I think there's no question Duquesne was, is the better striker on the feet. He's going to have the reach advantage here as well, and I think that he eventually – finds that target enough times that, I mean, it's going to be pretty clear who the better fighter is if it stays standing. So Stamen's game plan has to be to get the fight to the ground, utilize that wrestling. That's going to be the key to this fight for him, I think. And uh, Duquesne is going to want to sprawl brawl, keep the fight upright, and just kind of torch Stamen along the way. So a tough fight. I think, I mean, you can make a case for Stamen getting some takedowns, like I said, and maybe surviving long enough to um, to win some rounds, 29-28 type of decision win. That's why it makes this fight intriguing, I think. Duquesne Wall, again, has the hype, has the ability to to make a deep run in the in the Bantamweight division. Um, and I, by the way, I should mention Stamen's debut was actually a featherweight. So he's dropping back down to Bantamweight, which is intriguing as well, because I think that he'll look even better um, in the Bantamweight division in the UFC. Now, again, tough fight for him here, but we'll see where both these guys go, because they could both definitely win some fights in the Bantamweight division. So I think the hype train, though, continues a little bit here with Duquesne. Wah. I think he, he might face some adversity uh, at first, but as the fight progresses, I think he finds his way to keep the fight upright, and then his striking kind of takes over, and, and he wins his fight. So I'm I'm going to pick Duquesne Wall to, to get the W over a very game Stamen here. Cody Stamen is talented. Absolutely. I mean, he is uh, a guy that came in with a lot less hype behind him entering his UFC debut than his opponent. I mean, Duquesne Wall is a guy that has been hyped up as the next big thing in the Bantamweight division for a long time. I, I think for years people were saying he was the best fighter that hadn't been signed by the UFC. And then he finally did, and the UFC debut did not disappoint. He looked great. But Stamen, I mean, he faced a talented fighter in Terry and Ware in his UFC debut, and he took him down eight times. Ended up winning a one-sided decision. It was a fantastic performance. Uh, Stamen is a great wrestler and good ground and pound. He's tenacious, aggressive, and that's exactly the type of style you need if you want to take out Duquesne Or just to be in a really good power striker. Um, 
Duquesne is extremely well-rounded. I mean, he doesn't quite have the level of wrestling that Stamen has training onto France, but, I mean, he has a, an exceptional ground game. I think he has a better submission game than Stamen. He's the better striker than Stamen. Um, and then he has all the transitions in between the striking and the grappling and the wrestling and, and everything. That's really where he shines is the fact that he doesn't really have any weaknesses. He's just an extremely competent, well-rounded, dangerous fighter that's athletic and and young. I mean, even though he's been a guy that people have been hyping up as a top prospect for years, he's still just 24 years old. So uh, this is a kid that a lot of people are excited about. And uh, as good as Cody Stamen is, I just think that Duquesne has enough other abilities that will overcome Stamen's wrestling. Uh, I think Duquesne might be able to stuff some takedowns, and then when he does stuff them, he's going to do some damage. Uh, and if it goes to the floor and Stamen gets top position, I can see Duquesne either scrambling back to his feet, maybe trying to submit Stamen off of his back, maybe even sweeping him. Uh, like, this kid knows what he's doing just about everywhere. So, I just like Duquesne Wah due to his well-roundedness, and I just don't think Stamen's wrestling is going to be enough. So, I have to side with Duquesne Wah, but if Stamen takes him down repeatedly and keeps him down and ends up grinding out a decision, it would not be the biggest shocker in the world to me. But my pick is going to be Duquesne Wah. Now, moving on to the pay-per-view main card, and... Moving back to the lightweight division, we have Benil Darius, who is 14 and 3, taking on Evan Dunham, who is 17 and 6. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? Up in Darius, minus 230, the comeback on Dunham at plus 170. And right now, looking over five dimes, it is currently Darius, minus 235, Dunham, plus 195. So line margins have tightened up a little bit. Two way action is coming into this fight as well. Man, Dunham is one guy that doesn't get enough respect. I mean, he's been on the UFC roster for a, a while now, and he hasn't been the most active fighter, I guess, as of late. But, I mean, he's had plenty of fights in the UFC against very, very good competition. And at one point, I mean, the guy was definitely one of the upper tier lightweights on the roster. I mean, he was looking like he was getting that title shot. And fortunately for him back then, I mean, it got derailed a little bit um, when he lost. I mean, we're we're going all the way back to – um after his loss to Shirk, when uh, a Guillard beat him, actually, Melvin um, ended up knocking him out. I mean, that derailed him a little bit there. But I, I, up to that point, I mean, he was one of the best um, up-and-coming lightweights on the roster. Since that time, though, he's faced some very good, solid competition along the way. I mean, basically the best of the best. He's pulled off quite a few upsets along the way as well. And it's it's his tenacity. I mean, the guy has no quit in him at all. He, he always shows up in shape. He pushes a high pace. He's got good wrestling. He's got a little bit underrated power on the feet as well with the striking. He's a bit slow at times. I, I wish that that would clean up a little bit for him. If he'd get a little bit faster maybe with the striking. I mean, but it is what it is. I mean, he's just not a very fast striker, so it's not going to improve. But, I mean, I think that that, that kind of holds him back a little bit with that, but I think he makes up for his speed factor with a lot of the other stuff, and I think heart is is a big uh, factor here with his fight IQ as well. I mean, now, again, there's nothing that this guy has not seen um, thus far in the UFC, so Darius, even though he's a, a very complete fighter and a tough matchup, I mean, again, Dunham's been in there with the best, so it's another just another guy that he's going to face that is an elite-level lightweight in Darius, and, and I'm saying that because I think Darius is just that. Talk about getting derailed a little bit. I mean, unfortunately for Darius, he, he looked like he was kind of on his way, um, climbing towards the top, but he, he suffered that crazy loss. I think it's a crazy loss to Kiesa along the way because I was, I was surprised that he got submitted by Kiesa. I mean, more so than anything else. So, uh, even though Kiesa has that, that crazy good ground game and that obviously if he takes your back, you're in pretty much trouble, but Darius has, I mean, he's a BJJ black belt, very accomplished on the ground. So that was a bit of a surprise. So that derailed him a little bit. And then of course his last loss to, uh, Barboza, um, where he got caught with that knee. I mean, that that's not a good thing either. So he's looking to bounce back from that. But in between, he's had some pretty impressive performances. And Darius's game, I mean, on the feet, 
it's getting better. I mean, the guy has become – at first when he made the, his UFC debut, he was more known for his ground game. But right now he's such a complete fighter. I mean, he's become a threat on the feet as well. So he's got some knockout power on the feet. The guy utilizes his kicking game well on the feet as well. He's got good wrestling. I mean, it's to the point where Darius's wrestling is probably a little bit underrated. So you can get the fight to the ground more times than not. And then once on the ground, his submission ability is off the charts in most cases as well. So I think that's why – this matchup in particular for Dunham is, is just tough because, again, I say that Dunham, there's nothing Dunham hasn't seen before, but Darius, in my opinion, is just a little bit better than Dunham in almost all aspects of the game. Now, again, you can't question Dunham's heart and his uh, IQ and the experience that he has, but I still think that Darius probably beats him up on the feet. I think Darius might be able to control the ground aspect of things as well. Um, and so it's going to be a tough, tough fight for Dunham to win here. So I think Darius gets back on track and maybe impressively because if, if there's anything that I do question about Dunham as well, it is that chin. He's a bit chinny at times. Now, again, Darius, he's been knocked out a couple times as well. So you never know. But I think in this matchup here, Darius is striking is, is better. So I think he has a better chance to actually score a knockout win over Dunham along the way if it goes that route. So I think Darius can win on the cards. Darius could probably win inside the distance here as well. So the pick is Darius to win. These guys actually have similar skill sets, but Darius is just a little bit more refined. I mean, Evan Dunham is a talented ground fighter. Benil Darius is a world champion grappler. Evan Dunham has developed some pretty solid overall technical striking. Benil Darius works at King's MMA and has turned into a very dangerous striker. So where is Evan Dunham going to have the, the best chance of success to me, it has to be with pace. Um, Benil Darius is a guy that is absolutely lethal early in fights, but as fights start to move, go on, he does slow down. Uh, you've seen it in the Edson Barbosa fight where he started strong, uh, actually was out striking Barbosa in terms of pace and tempo and takedown attempts, like just really pushing a high pace, but started to slow down telegraphed uh, the setup for uh, his takedown attempts, and then boom, knee in the face. Same thing again with Michael Chiesa. It wasn't a knee in the face, but Darius was smoking Chiesa in the first round. Then he got a little tired, slowed down, Chiesa took his back. Darius didn't respect the back take like he should have. Boom, gets submitted. So... I do think that if there's any chance for Dunham to win, it's by outlasting Darius. Darius is going to start strong. He's going to kick very hard. He's going to punch hard. And if that does not put away Evan Dunham, then Dunham has a chance to win the second and third round, maybe even pull off a finish as Darius starts to fade. Uh, that being said, overall, Darius is a lot younger. He's about seven years younger. He's faster. He hits harder. He's more technical. It's tough not to pick him. I mean, when realistically the only thing going against Darius is chin strength and conditioning, I have to side with Darius. I, I don't really see Evan Dunham as a big power striker. I don't see him taking advantage of Darius having uh, chin issues. And uh, Dunham, as good as he is, I think there's a really good chance that Darius puts him away at some point. So... <laughs> I have to side with my gut here and my gut saying that Benil Darius gets back on track by stopping veteran Evan Dunham's four-fight win streak. So my pick is going to be Benil Darius. Now moving down to the women's flyweight division, only the second flyweight fight in UFC history for women, we have Mara Romero Borella, who is 11-4 and four with one no contest, taking on Kalindra Faria, who is 18-5-1. Now, Nate, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Up in Faria, minus 270, the comeback umbrella at plus 190. Right now, over five dimes, we have seen a little bit of drop in price. Right now, it's Faria, minus 190, the comeback umbrella, plus 165. So my opener was a tad high, everybody coming in more so on the underdog umbrella here. I'm a little bit surprised. Faria, I think, has a little bit more hype behind her. She's, I think, faced a better competition throughout her career, and she's a little bit more well-known to the diehard fans out there. But with all that being said, Barella, I mean, especially in her last performance and digging in uh, a little bit deeper, I've been impressed with her. I mean, I think she was 
one of those fighters that wasn't going to get a ton of respect or recognition um, because she's faced a little bit of weaker competition throughout her career. But as of late, she's picked it up and she's actually um, had some quality wins. I, I know her her last win in Invicta over Dudeva was a pretty solid win. She was able to control the ground aspect of that fight a little bit. So I think she's kind of to the point where working with American top team as well, coming from Brazil and, and she's just getting better and better. She's getting more confidence. And I think what the best part of her game really overall is um, her ability to kind of push a high pace to get the fight to the floor when she needs to. And then from the top position, she ends up uh, dropping some decent ground and pound and uh, also looks for some subs along the way as well on the feet though. She's no slouch. She has some power. I um, mean, she can be effective, but I think that's where she's going to lack here. I think that, um, Faria actually is a little bit faster on the feet. I think she is, is the better and more diverse striker on the feet. She pushes a higher pace overall. She also looks for some takedowns along the way. And, and from top position, she could do some damage. So this is going to be a competitive fight. So again, I understand a little bit why the line might have been a tad high. And then the dog action came in early on because it probably was a dog or pass situation with the price. And it could still very well be because I'm expecting it to be like a 29, 28 type of split decision type of fight. I do think it probably goes to the scorecards. I know both these ladies are stepping in kind of on short notice for this fight and I'm expecting it to kind of go back and forth but I am going to pick Faria because I do think that she is just a little bit more accomplished at this point she's just a little bit further ahead than Barella but I mean if Barella can kind of control the tempo of this fight meaning to kind of bully um, Faria here I think that she can uh, obviously have some success and maybe possibly pull off the upset win but I think overall Faria is going to do enough damage on the feet and I think she's going to do enough to control the fight just enough that it's she wins a very close competitive type of decision so my pick is going to be Faria to defeat uh, Barella in a close fight this is a, a tough matchup I mean this fight was added at the last second and that wasn't even the uh, original fight um, when Jessica I and Paige Van Sand dropped off, they decided to add Andrea Lee versus uh, Faria. And then Lee ended up getting pulled because she hadn't passed the protocol yet for USADA. So they brought in Barella. But, and then that, I think that was only announced like a less than a week ago. So they haven't had a lot of time for these girls to prepare for this USC debut. So there are a ton of variables with this fight. Now, uh, Faria has had experience against, against better competition overall, but she's lost all those fights, uh, against, uh, Kavalkevich and, uh, I think she faced Cadelia and Jessica Aguilar. She, she lost every single time she's faced one of those, uh, top competition. Uh, her best wins are like against Karina Dom, who's pretty much irrelevant at this point in women's MMA. So... Uh, Barella actually has picked up a couple more quality wins, especially her recent one where she main evented an Invicta show and picked up a close decision win over Milana Dudeva, who was a fighter that was in the, the UFC for women's bantamweight division and had gone one and two. So the, the fact that Barella was able to uh, defeat Dudeva at flyweight, Dudeva dropped down to her more natural weight class. I think that's pretty impressive. Now, it's not like Dudeva is a world beater, but uh, it's a quality win. So, uh, Barella in that fight, I think she showcased some tendencies that are making me a little concerned. She fought off her back feet. Uh, she was moving backwards a little too much on the feet. She landed better strikes than Dudeva, but she did allow Dudeva to kind of dictate where the fight was going, whether it was going to be pushed into the fence or uh, on the feet. Dudeva was the one that was controlling the center of the cage for at least the beginning. So I'm a little concerned about that. But uh, what I did like was when the fight did go to the ground, I thought Dudeva uh, was not able to keep Barella down. And then uh, eventually Barella was able to get top position in the fight. So uh, it was a close fight, but you know Barella looked decent. And she trains out of American Top Team alongside all the best women in the world right now. Uh, young Chechek against... Uh, uh, Nunez. So that's something you definitely have to, to consider is she's getting better every day training with really elite women. Uh, now, Faria, I'm not quite sure what gym she's working at because I know like Batello, who's making her debut, is out of Nova Uniao, but I, I think it's more of a smaller gym for Faria. So, uh, and honestly, I thought Faria was getting thrown to the wolves for her UFC debut against Lee, who the UFC is a lot higher on. So 
this is an opportunity here for Barella to come in as a rate, late replacement into a late replacement fight and get a, a solid performance. This fight could honestly go either way. There's a lot of unknown variables with these women, but I'm going to side with Barella. I think the training environment she's in right now is giving her a little bit more room for growth. And I think that she showcases some of that. And if she's taken a leap since the last time we saw her when she was main eventing Invicta, then I think she'll be in a good position to pick up a victory here. So my pick is going to be Barella. Now moving all the way up to the heavyweight division, we have Fabricio Verdum, who is 21-7-1, taking on Derek Lewis, who is 18-5 with one no contest. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Verdum minus 230, the comeback in Lewis at plus 170. Right now, looking over five times, it's 255. Minus 255 for Verdum, the comeback in Lewis at plus 215. So a little bit more action coming in Verdum's way. This is kind of tough. I mean, I'm not surprised. Verdum is by far the better fighter here. There's no question. I mean, you got to give, take your hat off to Lewis because the guy is definitely a warrior. He's the type of guy that is no joke in heavyweight division. You cannot take him lightly. I mean, the guy, he's a beast. I mean, and no pun intended, but the guy is that type of fighter. I mean, he, he brings it every time. He's tough to get rid of. I mean, he's hard to finish. Um, he's never been submitted throughout his UFC career or his MMA career, I should say. And he's facing a submission artist in this spot that is more than just that. But I mean, stylistically, like I said, this should be a terrible matchup for Lewis because um, typically he likes to get the fight to the ground. And if he's able to get top position on his opponents, he's able to drop some bombs. But Verdum is one guy that you probably in the heavyweight division have to have a little bit of caution if you do take him down and um, you play the guard game with him. Or, you know, it's going to be hard for me to believe that Lewis can actually pass that guard um, at least and get mount or, or drop a you know, get in a position where he could drop some significant damage. Now, that being said, it might only take a couple shots and he might get a few through if he is able to get top position on Verdum. And Verdum is at, at right now, he's 40 years old. I mean, I know he's, he's actually been competing at a high level. And as of late, the last couple of years, in my opinion, it's the best Verdum we've ever seen, even though he's aging as a heavyweight. I mean, as far as his overall skill set goes, because he's improved his stand up game so much, I think Verdum, again, he's never been better. But now we're starting to see that Chin maybe suffer a little bit. And, you know, he's been getting clipped, he's been getting rocked. He's He's got knocked out by Stipe. Um, so Verdum is definitely a 40-year-old that we can see that decline spot hitting any time. And Lewis has enough power that he's always going to be a threat in this fight. But outside of all that, Verdum, I think, here is the better striker overall. I think, obviously, Verdum has the ground edge in this fight as well. And, I mean, he's faced a higher-level competition from top to bottom than Lewis has. So it should really be his fight to win or lose. If his chin holds up and he just... I mean, he doesn't shell up and not fight. I think Verdum can be successful, whether it's on the feet or on the ground. So hard not to pick Verdum. I think he gets the win here. But from the betting standpoint, again, he's 40 years old. You're laying almost two and a half to round, two and a half to one over the guy. I don't think you should kind of touch his fight and lay that kind of chalk, especially at this stage of his career. So I think it's either dog or pass. You stay away from it probably more so than anything. But be cautious out there if you are betting this fight. My pick is going to be Verdum, though, to get the W. In terms of skill set, Fabricio Verdum is the better striker, and he's the better ground fighter. Derek Lewis does have a little bit more knockout power, and I would say Lewis has a slightly better chin. Not by much, but a little bit better. Um, but, yeah, that's about it. I mean, in terms of how these guys match up, Verdum has some really good Muay Thai skills. He should be able to pick apart Lewis on the feet, uh, both with his kicking game and his and his hands. Um, I'm a little worried about what happens if he just gets clipped randomly because Verdum does not have the best chin. I mean, it all started way back in the day when he got knocked out of the UFC by Junior Dos Santos. But uh, since then, uh, when he lost his title to Stipe, he got blasted pushing forward aggressively too aggressively. So uh, it's definitely possible that Lewis could connect with something, but man, how can you trust Lewis at this point? He went on a great run in the heavyweight division, but then he lost to Mark Hunt and he basically retired in the cage. And then now he's not retired after who even knows how he was able to have like a really proper training camp with Hurricane Harvey going on in the Houston area. He was having to save flood victims and stuff during the preparation for this fight. So it's just really tough to, to think that Lewis has a legitimate chance. I mean, the only thing that I can see happening is Lewis landing a haymaker on the feet, which he could do. He does have a long reach and 
uh, he does have power. Or Verdum, who likes to pull guard all the time, like against other people, if he pulls guard against Lewis, Lewis, almost all of his victories have been by ground and pound from top position. And if Verdum gets cocky with his guard and Lewis starts cracking him from top position, he could win that way too. So those are realistically the only two ways I see Derek Lewis getting a victory. And I just don't think that's enough. I, I think if Verdum has any sense whatsoever, he avoids a lot of those situations. He fights long and just picks apart Lewis like Mark Hunt did. And Mark Hunt has sh- way shorter and has a shorter reach than Verdum. So the, the blueprint to beat Derek Lewis is out there. And if Verdum follows it, he shouldn't have a problem. So I'm going to side with Verdum, the former champion. Now moving on to the co-main event of the evening. We have a flyweight title fight between champion Demetrius Johnson, who is 26, 2, and 1. And he's taking on Ray Borg, who is 11 and 2. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? For UFC 216, I opened Johnson minus 1250 to come back on Borg at plus 800. And I'm saying for UFC 216 because they were originally scheduled to fight at UFC 215 and the line opened about half of that actually. And it was bet up to this point. So it was easy for us to reset the line where it kind of settled out last time. But that being said, obviously a lot of respect coming in towards Johnson, not a ton of respect going towards Borg. But I, I do think this is kind of an intriguing fight to me, in my opinion. Johnson is pound for pound the best fighter on the planet. I mean, he's just the most well-rounded fighter. The, the guy, I mean, he's going for the title um, defense record of all time in the UFC. So that tells you, I mean, he, that's how many successful defenses he's had and against very solid competition. I should quote the current line real quick, though. At five dimes currently, it is still minus 1250 plus 800. So again, it kind of where it settled last time at 215 and it's kind of staying steady here as well. A lot of people, I think, are, are tentative to bet this fight where it is because Johnson, again, he's been the man. He's faced the who's who in the flyweight division. He's had some su- success in higher divisions than in the past as well. So Johnson is just, I mean, there's, there's not really too many flaws to his game at all. I mean, the guy is just a machine out there. I mean, his cardio can last forever. I mean, the guy could beat you on the feet. He could beat you with his wrestling. He could beat you with his uh, jujitsu skill. It's amazing to me because if you think about it, I mean, Demetrius Johnson at times will almost purposely, I think, try to beat you in your, at your own game. The point being, if you look at his uh, last fight against Wilson Hayes, who submits Wilson Hayes? I mean, Wilson Hayes is a world-class jiu-jitsu practitioner that has never been submitted before. And, and with Demetrius Johnson, I mean, he was able to get the sub against a guy. I mean, I was, I was shocked, honestly. I didn't think it would come, but I mean, that's, that's how special of a talent Demetrius Johnson is. So the guy is able to submit people that you would not normally think he could. He's able to just... I mean, keep on winning for a reason. He's that good. So again, pound for pound, in my opinion, he's at the top of the game. There's no question about that. But it's still intriguing here, in, in my opinion, with this fight because even though I just said Wilson Hayes is one of the, you know the better ground guys on the roster and, and he, he's an accomplished jiu-jitsu practitioner, Borg is just a, a little bit different. I mean, you can't really prepare for what Borg brings to the table, especially on the ground. I mean, he has obviously the jujitsu skills as well to go along with it. That's what highlights his game. And he hasn't really been out grappled too much by many. I know that in the Scoggins fight, Scoggins was able to control Borg on the ground and just kind of maintain and, and keep him down there. And that's kind of one of the ways he won that fight. It was obviously, um, kind of controlling the aspect of the ground, which normally Borg is able to scramble out of bad positions, get top position himself. And, you know, you might think you have him down and then before you know it, he has your back and he, he's looking to submit you. So Scoggins was successful. Um, again, controlling that aspect of the game. But outside of that, Borg has really um, have been a handful for everybody that he's faced. And again, more, more times than not, if you put him on his back, he ends up on your back. So you got to be careful with Borg. That's how slick he is on the ground. And his his submissions, his chokes, I mean, his fight IQ overall is really solid. Now, of course, we got to mention his uh, concern with, or my concern at least, with the weight cut. I mean, at times, Borg doesn't always have the smoothest weight cut. So we'll see if he can make weight. But I think he will this time. He's had enough time, obviously, um, since... 215 to kind of get things uh together i know he had to back out due to illness they're saying it wasn't 
you know, to do with the weight cut, but we'll, we'll see. I'm a little bit skeptical about that. But outside of that, I mean, for Borg to pull off this huge upset, it's going to have to be on the ground because I think even though Borg is okay on the feet, I still think Demetrius Johnson is better on the feet. So if any advantage at all that Borg would have over Demetrius Johnson, it would probably be the ground. I'm not saying he does have that because like I just said, Johnson is able to beat even the best of the best on the ground as well. So we'll see how the scrambling and how the ground game actually plays out here. Um, if at all, but that being said, it's, it's going to be a fun fight. So I, I wouldn't necessarily lay that chalk, especially at twelve fifty uh, on Johnson, because Borg has such a strong ground game. And again, he thinks he believes, at least confidence wise, in himself. He thinks that he's going to be the one to throw Demetrius Johnson. So I think the line's a tad bit high. Um, overall, obviously, my opener for two fifteen was a lot lower than this, but I still have a hard time picking against the man right now. I mean, Demetrius Johnson again. I mean, he he pretty much has an advantage in almost all areas with that little question mark a little bit um, with the ground game, the ground battle here. I hope we do see a ground battle because it should be a fun one. So I'm not going to pick against the man. My pick is Demetrius Johnson. He probably retains his title and breaks the all-time UFC uh, title defense record. So hats off to him if he gets it done. We've talked about this fight before. I mean... Demetrius Johnson was supposed to face Ray Borg in the last pay-per-view, UFC 215, and then Borg got sick during fight week, and the fight got canceled. So there's really not much new, I'm going to say. I'll just mention that Demetrius Johnson has shown a little bit of weakness on his back uh, at times, and if Ray Borg can put him there, he could win. I mean, uh, Ian McCall had Johnson in a lot of trouble in their first match, went from top position, he... Uh, had Johnson back mounted and was dropping some bombs. And then uh, Tim Elliott was able to win the first round, getting top position against Demetrius Johnson in his title fight uh, that he won off of the Ultimate Fighter. And then when Dominic Cruz fought Demetrius Johnson, he actually utilized his wrestling to beat Johnson, and Johnson was actually holding his own with Cruz on the feet. So in Johnson's moments of weakness... He has had those moments on the canvas, uh, on his back. So if Borg can get this fight to the floor and get top position, there's a chance he could pull off the upset. That's it, though. Uh, on the feet, Johnson's better by a significant margin. In the clinch, Johnson might be one of the best clinch fighters in all of MMA, just with absolutely hellacious knees and elbows. He, he can finish any flyweight in the, in the division with if he can keep them in the clinch for an extended period of time. That's how good his dirty boxing is. And then on the ground, Johnson wins plenty of fights on the ground. He has some mission victories over uh, black belts like Wilson Hayes. He has uh, multiple uh, submission victories with John Moraga, Horiguchi, you name it. So uh, I think Ray Borg has his hands full. I like Ray Borg. I think he's a very talented fighter, but... It feels like he's still getting this fight too early in his career, kind of like Horiguchi did, just because there's a dearth of contenders right now in the flyweight division. So I got to side with Demetrius Johnson. Ray Borg is a great fighter with great ground skills, but I just don't think that's enough. And I think Johnson breaks the record on Saturday night as long as everybody stays healthy during fight week and the fight actually takes place. Now this brings us to the main event for the UFC interim lightweight title. We have Tony Ferguson, who is 23 and 3, taking on Kevin Lee, who is 16 and 2. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I put Ferguson minus 185, the comeback on Lee plus 145. For the most part, it's been uh, um, Ferguson getting the action. He's minus 230 right now, the comeback on Lee is at plus 190, but. Um, there has been some two-way action because at times, uh, not too long ago, the line did drop a little bit on in Lee's favor. So we did get some dog action uh, coming in Lee's way as well. So there will be two-way action on this fight with, I think, the hype and obviously the more respect going towards Ferguson. I mean, rightfully so. I mean, what he's accomplished. I mean, right now he is definitely one of the best lightweights in the world. He has such a complete game. I mean, tough as nails, hard to submit. I mean, hard to outstrike. Uh, just that killer instinct on the feet as well. I mean, everything or not even on the ground. I mean, Ferguson is just a very, very complete fighter. Uh, tough as nails, like I said. So he's not easy to finish. And I think he's mentality right now. He knows he's one of the best in the world and he wants that to wear that strap. So Ferguson is at a good place mentally, physically, stylistically here against Lee. He has a lot of advantages going into this fight. 
But man, I wouldn't really underestimate Lee too much in this fight either. I mean, Lee's kind of coming into his own. He's getting better fight by fight. Uh, there's no doubt about that. He's had an impressive win over Kiesa in his last fight. I think a lot of people were, you know, assuming that Kiesa, if he, he got his back, he would probably submit Lee, but Lee was able to kind of turn uh, things around and, and get, uh, Kiesa's back and submit him as well. Controversy or not. I mean, a lot of people, you know, the referee, they thought the referee might have stopped it too earlier, but I mean, that, that choke was pretty much in. I know that Kiesa's a game fighter, but that being said, before that, Lee was able to submit, uh, Trinaldo as well. So, and before that, Mustafayev. So, Mustafayev. So he's, Lee's one of these guys that I think he's underrated, especially when the ground game. I mean, he's, he's getting better. He's developing a stand-up game. He has a little bit of pop on his, on his feet. Um, he can definitely throw down, but his chin is definitely suspect. That's one thing that bothers me about Lee here is, his chin, I mean, it's been checked before. He's been knocked out before. I mean, it's it's not a good look for him. I mean, he, he suffered a loss to a grappler in, in Leonardo Santos. So I think that's fresh still, even though it happened, you know, back a couple of years ago. I think it's still kind of fresh in people's minds where they don't really respect Lee's stand-up as much. But af- ever since then, really, he's been on a roll facing solid competition, and he's looked great doing so. I mean, very good competition. So I wouldn't necessarily count Lee out of this fight. I think he does have a path to victory here. He's the type of fighter that regardless, I mean, if he gets your back, even though Ferguson has really good submission defense, if Lee gets his back, Lee can submit him and win this fight. So that's the danger aspect, especially early on in this fight. The other thing that bothers me about Lee, obviously, is his conditioning. I mean, he's been known to kind of slow down as the fight goes on. Um, and in this fight here, obviously, it's for the interim title. If he slows down, Ferguson is going to make him pay for it. You cannot slow down with a guy like Ferguson. So... It's almost that Lee has to win the first few rounds to get the job done here. If not, he's probably not going to win on the scorecards, and he probably gets finished before it even hits the scorecards as he gasses a little bit. But that being said, where the line is right now, it is definitely a dog or pass situation. I mean, Kevin Lee at plus 190 compared to laying the chalk on Ferguson right now at minus 230. I have enough respect for Lee that I wouldn't lay that chalk, that's for sure, even though Ferguson has been uh, on quite a roll and is, is arguably the best lightweight out there that we've seen. It's still tough. I mean, because Lee brings that ground game and the effectiveness with his submission game to the table. So for me, I think it's an intriguing fight. I've been kind of bouncing back and forth, believe it or not, in this fight a little bit, but I do have to side with Ferguson. He has the better cardio. I think he's a, a bigger threat overall in this fight, obviously, as well. And I think he probably gets the job done. But let me just say this, as I do in, in almost every podcast, our official and final picks. Our staff picks on MMAOzbreaker.com, usually posted on fight day. That'll have our official final pick, so make sure you check it out. And if Brian and I make any change, they'll be on there. But for right now, I am going to pick Ferguson to get the W here over Lee and what I hope is an exciting fight. I'm almost certain this fight is going to be exciting for however long it lasts. The thing is, for Kevin Lee to win, it can't last that long. Uh, Kevin Lee is very talented, but he has a bit of conditioning issues. He's so explosive and aggressive early in fights that allows him to just overwhelm opponents and get quick finishes. But if he doesn't get the quick finish, he does start to slow down. And Tony Ferguson is a cardio machine. He has good conditioning. He has uh, a high pace. He has a good chin. He has good submission defense. And he's just a freak of nature with a really long uh, limbs and a very unorthodox approach to cage fighting. So I think Kevin Lee clearly has his hands full here. Um, Lee, if he's going to win, he needs to get takedowns early and often, and he needs to aggressively pursue the finish because I don't think those takedowns are going to be coming for extended periods of time. I can see Lee getting takedowns in maybe the first two rounds, but That's going to tire him out, and by the third round and on, I think Tony Ferguson just starts lighting him up. And Kevin Lee cannot take that kind of punishment. Uh, As you saw in the Leonardo Santos fight, I mean, Santos didn't even hit him with that big of a shot, and Lee got rocked and then eventually finished. So uh, Tony Ferguson, he is a much more dangerous striker. I mean, this guy went toe-to-toe with Rafael Dos Anjos, with Edson Barboza, and he got the better of them on the feet really good technical strikers because he was just so aggressive and pushed a high pace and put a lot of pressure on his opponents. Uh, and then on the ground, Tony Ferguson has a really crafty submission game. He has a great Darce choke. He uses those long limbs very well. Um, he has this kooky somersault, which he's used to get out of takedown attempts. I mean, 
there's just so much about Tony Ferguson that I just love. And, and I've underestimated him repeatedly throughout his career because I thought that he took unnecessary risks and fights. And that's still true, but he's just has such a good recovery from making mistakes that he, that it doesn't seem to affect him. So, uh, Kevin Lee, as talented as he is, as good of a wrestler as he is, the conditioning is a huge factor here. And if he does not get a quick finish in this fight, Tony Ferguson is just going to take over and do some serious damage. So overall, uh, I think Kevin Lee will hold his own early, but he, I don't think he gets the quick finish. And I think Tony Ferguson takes over late and eventually gets a TKO stoppage over Kevin Lee. So my pick is going to be Tony Ferguson to become the interim UFC lightweight champion. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for UFC 216. Our premium bets for the event will be released on Friday following the weigh-ins, so stay tuned for that if you're an MMA Oddsbreaker Premium member. If we have a free play to give out, make sure to follow at MMAOBPremium on Twitter because that's where we'll post them first. We can also notify you of our free bets via email alert if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAOddsbreaker.com and we'll add you to our free bet mailing list. Special thanks to our sponsor, Five Dime Sportsbook. Good luck, everyone, and hopefully the betting gods are on your side this weekend.